I've paid thousands of dollars in courses to learn what you're basically teaching on your podcast for free. What you're putting out there is so valuable. So, you know, I just really want to acknowledge you and I definitely send everyone to your podcast. You were virtually one of the first mentors that I looked up to and started following. You're always one step ahead of the game, so I just wanted to give you kudos and props for that because lots of people are watching, lots of people are learning from it. Tucker and the whole TTM crew, Dan and Chris, thanks so much for your support. I love what you guys do and a huge, huge fan. Having this support's huge, so I'm grateful for that. What's up, everybody out there in listener land? This is another episode of the Real Deal Podcast. And as always, I'm your host, Tucker Merrihew. I want to thank you guys for joining me for a busy week episode, that's for sure. It's been quite the week. My uh, partner in crime, my sidekick in the office, Mr. Chris, has been on a Griswold family vacation all week. He uh, flew to Vegas, drove about four hours to the in-laws, stayed there for a bit. And then he drove about 10 hours to uh, Wally World, a.k.a. Disneyland, where he's been for the last few days. So we're uh, eager to have him back next week. I'm sure he'll be full of stories, all the uh, things that happen on uh, family vacations with multiple kids driving across the countryside. But uh, this week he's been out. So I have been doing double time, which uh, basically means that I haven't been able to line up uh, an interview. So I th- thought, you know what, I'll jump on here and I'll record a uh shorter show of uh, a couple things that are relevant to this week, which is work-life balance, uh, which I have very little of this week (laughs) because I've been doing a whole bunch of different tasks, uh, doing lead intake, doing uh, man on the phones, uh, managing what I manage normally, creating content, uh, taking calls uh, from doing student calls, doing intake calls for our next round of deal generator, talking to people in DFA, all kinds of stuff. So it's just been a crazy week. So my work-life balance has been way out of balance this week, but it's a topic that I wanted to dive into a little more because uh, I thought it's something that should be explored. There's a lot of a lot of people that have different takes on it, and uh, I just kind of want to break it down. I want to break it down so that you can figure out what's right for you, because at the end of the day, I think that's the biggest thing. So anyway, that's what we're going to talk about on this week's show. Before I get into that real quick, just quick update for you. I'm going to say quick a lot. Quick, 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 right? Uh, the Driving for Dollars app, we've got a new tier, two new tiers actually coming out. Uh, one is a uh, 2,000 uh, property skip trace tier for those of you guys that want to build uh, big lists uh, that are skip trace within the app that tier is coming out uh, and then also our just list building tier where you simply can build as big a list as you want uh, it just logs the property address exports it to you and then we can actually skip trace it outside of the app and outside of iTunes monopoly uh, that they have on every dollar that comes in so it's gonna be a really inexpensive version that you can use you can have everybody on your team use it you can have uber drivers use it and uh, whatever you want to do for people to help kind of identify crappy property, right? Or properties that should be bought by an investor. And uh, when they create a list under your account, you can see it at any point and uh, they can export it to you or you can export it yourself, but then they can tag it as, um, you know, under their name or however it is that you want them to signify that it's their list and their property. And if you ever close on it, you can pay them out. But uh, it'll be cheap, 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 folks. And uh, there's no reason not to use it. And it's a great tool to compile big lists or use a ton of bird dogs in order to deliver you properties that should be bought by investors. So keep an eye out for that. We'll have that rolling out this next week. On top of that, uh, we've had a ton of interest in our REA deal generator program. We are, we may have one slot left, maybe, um, at this point, which is great. I appreciate all you guys that, um, you know, had enough uh, trust in myself and Justin and our operation and the program to uh, schedule a call and talk with us. I talked to a lot of great people and uh, we've got, I think, the program pretty much full at this point. Um, We may have one slot uh, that's not totally confirmed, but that's about it. So we're looking to do six people and that's a wrap for our ability and our bandwidth this round, but um, we'll probably have another round towards sometime towards the end of 2019. But thank you very much for those of you guys that reached out to us and uh, that we were able to have a conversation with. Uh, It's awesome to reach out and talk to investors and just kind of see, you know, how everybody 
you know, how their business is operating now and uh, where they want to go and just really talk shop. And that's what a lot of those calls are all about. So we appreciate everybody that reached out and uh, we look forward to helping many of you in the future. Now, what's going on with me this week? Well, I kind of mentioned it a whole lot, right? Had two appointments yesterday, had a bunch of callbacks, had uh, a bunch of investor calls. Uh, today, we were shooting uh, the second part of Million Dollar Builds. We're going to put an episode out this week or maybe the beginning of next week. Uh, we had to shoot some progress footage uh, from earlier this week and then again today, kind of showing all the progress, make it a little more dynamic episode for you guys. Um, and then I've got uh, I've got birthdays and anniversaries next week, so i got to run some errands. i got to get some gifts so that uh, you know I'm not in the doghouse on uh, husband's side, which plays into work-life balance, right? That's what I'm telling you guys. So had a lot going on. We've got a new project, been doing some due diligence on, a little bit of a pain in the ass. I showed you guys some of the footage of it, um, or if you follow me on Facebook, you can see uh, what we're trying to figure out, which is basically it's a house, it's about 1,700 square feet. It's in a neighborhood where max price is probably somewhere in the 1.5 to $2 million range, depending on the house, the size, the lot. We're looking at exiting somewhere in the 1.2 range, We've got under contract for 550, which is basically lot value um, at this point based on numbers. And we're trying to figure out what the best way to skin this cat is. And originally we were just gonna knock it down and build new. The challenge is for those of you guys that are following me uh, on Facebook, you probably saw that uh, I showed the builder next door. He put a new house in, but when he did that, there's an alley that separates the two houses, the house he built and the house we're buying. And they raised the grade up on the alley three feet. And so the problem is for us is that it screws our grade because we have to do a side load garage if we build new in this neighborhood. It's just the, the requirements. It's, they got crazy requirements in this neighborhood, but that's one of them. If there's an alley available, you have to use it to access a garage. They don't want it on the front of the house, which is retarded. I guess I shouldn't say that's not politically correct. It's stupid. It's just dumb. And uh, on top of that, um, it just makes it really difficult. So they raised the grade up about three feet so that their approach into their garage is much flatter. Otherwise, it would have been you know really, really steep uphill. But in doing so, if we put a garage on the side of our house, it makes it really steep downhill. So it screws the marketability of the home. So they think they did it without the permission of the city and so for us to unwind it we could but it'd just be a big shit mess to get into we piss off the neighbors of course because they bought it based on thinking they had a flat approach into their driveway and that would change everything and so it just turns into this hornet's nest of crap so what we're trying to figure out is okay how can we rebuild this house which is a little more of a pain in the butt but essentially take it down to the four joists build it back put a second story on it uh, we've got to change where the load comes down on the, the foundation because otherwise they want an all new foundation for it. They won't let us build just off the original foundation. So we've got to shift kind of the load points. Um, we also have to figure out what we're doing with stormwater. There's just all kinds of stuff going on when we do a second story addition. And um, so anyway, that looks like what we're gonna do because then we can keep the garage on the front of the house. We can keep a backyard and uh, we can also make a really cool house. It's gonna be more tedious type work than just nuking the house that's there and building new, which we've done a lot in that neighborhood, but normally it's because the uh, houses are just much worse, to be honest with you. And um, this one's not a bad house and it's got a 1700 square foot footprint on the main floor. We can put a master on the main. Uh, it'll be an awesome house when we're done with it, but just a lot of due diligence on the front end. So that's consumed a lot of my week. Uh, we've got soil samples going on today because there's an oil tank that we think that we found in the front yard that the seller played uh, dumb about. So we got to make sure that the soil's not contaminated because if it is, then that's another bill. And since we're not tearing the house down, we can't just uh, excavate out all that dirt and that uh, tank uh, without anybody knowing. <laughs> we actually have to uh, get it decommissioned and kind of, you know, get all the paperwork filed with the DQ to make sure that none of the uh, soil is actually contaminated. So that's what's going on today on top of everything else that uh, we've got cranking. So busy 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 but uh that's pretty much all i want to talk about before we dive into the main topic so let's get into it all right real deals podcast listeners i want to talk quickly about our show's sponsor iron bridge lending if you guys have not reached out to iron bridge already to talk to them about funding some of your upcoming flip projects i highly encourage you to do so i've known the owner of iron bridge for a very long time i've personally borrowed millions of dollars from them over the years to do a number of different projects and i can say without a doubt they are the best hard money lending company i have ever come across and that is the reason why they are the sole sponsor of this show i've had a lot of other companies reach out to me and 
would want to sponsor this show, but I just won't do it. I feel like I need to be genuine in who we have sponsoring the show, and it needs to be somebody that I've personally done a ton of business with. So I personally vouch for their ability to be the best hands down in the world of hard money lending. You won't find better programs, you won't find better terms, and they're lending or will be lending in over 20 states. So chances are, if you're hearing this in whatever state you're in, it's definitely worth it to check out their website, reach out to them, see if they're lending in your state, and if they are, I would absolutely encourage you to do business with them. Another very cool thing to note is that they have a program for most rehabs where you can actually borrow up to 90% of the purchase price. Now this is given the fact that you are actually buying a deal, which if you're listening to the show, that means you probably are. But if you have an actual deal on the table, they'll fund up to 90% of your purchase price and they'll even give you rehab funds on top of that, which means that it only takes 10% down to get into a project, which is unbelievable in the hard money world. So. Do yourself a favor, reach out to Ironbridge Lending, have a conversation with them, see if they're a good fit for you and for your next project. I can guarantee you that you'll be happy that you did. All right, everybody, main topic time. And so at this point, I am gonna dive into the main topic and I'm sitting here, I'm waiting to go into uh, Fry's <laughs> to pick up a new computer. You ever gone into the bathroom? And uh, I know this doesn't have anything to do with it, but you guys will find it humorous. You ever go into the men's room? For those of you guys that are men, of course, or use the men's room, and you go to the urinal, right? And there's nobody else in the men's room. And then all of a sudden somebody comes in and they use the urinal right next to you. Never understood that always made me feel like whoever that guy is that does that is kind of a weirdo uh doesn't understand personal bait uh personal space boundaries and just kind of is uh very socially inept well i'm sitting here in a parking lot that's empty and uh there's like i don't know 200 parking spaces all around me and i get some weirdo that pulls up to me in my right he's got a business in the front party in the back mullet and uh he could have parked you know any number of other spaces but he pulled up real tight right next to me on the right side And then I've got a couple ladies that pulled right in front of me so that they can just stare at me for 10 minutes. So anyway, I'm going to record this with a weirdo on my right and two ladies staring at me at my front who uh, may also be a little socially uh, interesting, we'll call it. But anyway, the reason why I'm recording this week's show is because I want to talk about work-life balance. And work-life balance is something that is different for everybody. It's an interesting topic because, you know, there's a lot of people out there that, um, you know, it started with the Gary V's of the world, right? Where it was very hustle, hustle, hustle. And that seemed to inspire kind of the younger generation uh, pretty heavily. And then there's been a little bit of pushback now. You know, a lot of people have kind of, uh, you know, made their made their argument that that's not the best way to live life. And so they've grabbed people's attention out there on social by basically taking the anti-Gary V approach, which... You know, I understand both sides of the coin, but I think something that should be talked about is, you know, what is right for you? Because that that's the biggest thing. And also there are chapters in life. That, that's another thing as well. But, you know, I know plenty of people that are very successful in this business and they're happy. And that's the biggest thing, right? I think being happy is the biggest thing. And the reason why they're happy is because they've designed the business that they want to have. Um, You know, uh, a good friend of mine, one of our DFA members, Elliot Smith, he's designed a business that is very profitable, but also gives him a lot of time to do the things that he likes to do, which I think is ultimately why we're here, right? But he likes having that time to do those things. Now he's got family now, so his time is a little uh, more limited than it used to be, which is a whole, that goes into the whole chapters thing that I'll talk about here in a second, but he's built a business that he likes. Um, You know, for me, I have built a business that takes more of my time than him, but that's what I like. And so it really comes down to what's right for you at the end of the day. Now we can all kind of go out of balance even with what's right for us, right? We, We build this business and that's the beauty of real estate. We can kind of create a business that is what we want. Now, sometimes, and this is the challenge, right? Especially right now, because with everybody out there on social media posting how many deals they've done and you know, basically how big their operation is, Jay Scott had an interesting post that um, I'm sure many of you guys might've seen this past week. I commented on it and basically said, hey Jay, you, you, know, you struck a nerve. <laughs> and he said, yep. And uh, you know, it was basically, look, don't tell me about how many deals you're doing. Tell me about your bottom line, right? Tell me about whether or not you're growing your net profits versus just growing your operation and whether or not that growth in net net profits is worth all the additional stress, uh, overhead obligation that you're bringing on. That's the real conversation that needs to be had. And I think a lot of people get wrapped up in the, I need to do 100 deals a year, I need to do whatever, you know, 
I saw one post online that um, you know people tout the amount of revenue that they do in a month and how many deals it takes to get there, and you know I'll tell you right now that that amount of revenue that got posted online, which was uh, you know a high six figure number, we can do that in a month with two deals, right? Um, and so that's just a different way to do the business. Some people can do that in a month with one deal. Some people can do 10 times that amount in a year with one deal. Um, it just depends, right? It depends on the type of business that you want to build. And for me, I've been through the ups and downs of higher volume and kind of you know going all over the place and spending more money than we are now on marketing in order to bring in more leads. And it's just not the business that I wanted to run for me. Now, I want to run a business that I spend a lot of time in and I do a lot of different things and that's kind of my thing is I like to be a little varied in what it is that I spend my time doing. I'm not just spending my time in the real estate business. Obviously, I'm spending it in the app development business. I'm spending it in the education business. I'm spending it in the content business. But I'm doing all these things that require more time for me. But I don't want our real estate sticks and bricks operation to be a super high volume uh, wholesale type operation. It's just not what I want because then... It just causes more friction and challenges than I need on the back end of that. And I don't want to build out a massive business where I've got tons of acquisition managers and lead managers and and all kinds of positions like that. I just don't want it. It's not the business that would make me happy. So, you know, I see the guys that are doing that and I'm not knocking them by any means. If that's what they want, then all the power to them. Go grow it and do that. But that's not what I want. And it's okay if that's not what you want. And the problem is sometimes people don't know exactly what they want, right? They see it and they think that it's it's glamorous and it's where you should be. And then they build something like that and it's not in line with who they are. It's not in line with their personality. It's just too much stress. It's too much obligation. It takes away too much time from the things that they like to do. And then they're unhappy, right? So at the end of the day, you got to build a business that makes you happy or the happiest, right? I mean, every, being happy is always a challenge for everybody. Some people just, you know, they exude sunshine out of their butt. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just who they are. Uh, but those people are, are few and, and far between. You know, most of us have to actually design a life that makes us happy in order to be happy. And uh, we roll with the punches the best that we can. But that's one of the things that I've done at this point is I've designed a business that makes me happy. I like doing our real estate stuff. And in the real estate stuff, I like to do projects that have large margins attached to them so that we don't have to do huge volume in order to generate a great amount of net profits at the end of the year. And obviously our gross profits look ginormous. Net profits are significantly less because we do have overhead, we've got interest costs, we've got salaries, we've got marketing costs. We've got all those things like every other business has, but to generate the revenue for that side of the business, we're not a large volume wholesaler or rehabber operation. I don't want to rehab 100 houses a year. I'll tell you that right now. We did higher volume back in 2012, 2013, 2014, and it wasn't fun. It it just, it, it wasn't a fun business for me. And so I didn't want to run that business anymore. So that's why we climbed the real estate ladder. That's why we did higher margin stuff, but we had to take a risk and we had to go into higher price points. We had to get a new construction. We had to get into development. We had to do things that enabled us to get higher margin without doing more deals, right? Or generate, you know, higher amount of net profit at the end of the year without doing more deals. So that's that's kind of my thing. Now, in terms of work-life balance, right? Once you know the type of business that you want to build, now you got to figure out what's work-life balance for you, right? And so for me, um, you know, I'm in a challenging chapter of life to be totally honest with you because I've got two kids that are, you know, 4 and 2. And I've talked to a lot of people. And for those of you guys that don't have kids yet, I'm going to give you a little a little sneak peek of what it's all about, right? There's people that have kids and then there's people that don't. And if you don't have kids, enjoy your time because you've got a lot of it. And I think that a lot of people don't realize how much time they actually have for themselves until they have kids, which, you know, wake up folks. (laughs) You got a lot of time. You can do whatever you want with it. Really soak that up. But then you get into the chapter of one kid, right? One kid is kind of the first uh, chapter where you've got to give time to something else. You've got to help your wife or significant other with that kid. You know, the kid doesn't sleep a lot. You got somebody's got to do morning shift. Somebody's got to do night shift. Um, you know, it's just you've got something to take care of 24/7 other than yourself. And so that's chapter one. That's a bit of a challenge, but. To be honest with you, once you get to multiple kids, you look back and you go, don't be such a Nancy. That's pretty, pretty easy, all things considered. And so the one kid chapter is challenging because it's new. The two kid and up chapter gets really challenging, especially if you have challenging children, right? So I've got one kid that's a real challenge. That's for sure. He's uh, my daughter. 
she's not a bad kid. They're neither of them are bad kids, but my youngest one, I think he's got major OCD and ADD all wrapped into one, and the the kid is just a ball of energy. He has got an on switch and an off switch, and holy hell, he is hard to contain, and he just takes a lot of energy from me. So creating work life balance and balancing that at the same time is very very difficult. So even going on vacation is a challenge, right? A lot of people want to build a business so that we can go on vacation as much as we want. I'll tell you right now, going on vacation is more work than going to work. Like my Mondays are my old Fridays because weekends are they're tough and I know that's not the PC thing to say and people put stuff out on social media about how I built the life that that I can be present with my kids and play with them and this and that and this whole chapter at the beginning of uh you know uh this when kids are just starting to you know toddler stage and below it's a tough chapter especially if you have tough children I always talk about the analogy of uh when you get on an airplane right when I used to get on an airplane I'd look around I'd be like all right Hopefully, I'm not sitting next to anybody with kids, right? <laughs> now I'm that guy. But now when I get on the plane, I look at, and I've told this story before, but I look at the different types of people that are on the plane, right? You've got the people that get on the plane, like when I went to Maui a couple months ago, right? You get on the plane, and you look around, and you see people that's just a couple, right? couple going to Maui to have some good quality time together. You know, they got their magazine. They got their snack. Uh, you know, they're, they're holding hands, maybe a little kiss before takeoff. You know, it's this nice, uh, just nice kind of uh, aura, right? Just this good vibe you're going on vacation to a tropical place then the next couple has got one kid right and that kid you know let's say the kid's like three years old right maybe four years old and they got you know mom's got the kid snacked all packed in these nice tight ziploc bags the kid's got his nice earmuffs on he's watching his ipad you know he's got all his little toys packed away in his little uh you know whatever carry-on backpack thing everything's very nice and tidy maybe mom and dad ordered a mimosa or something you know they've got time to sip on and enjoy and the kid's easy to maintain and then you've got me (laughs) and everybody else that's me and more kids that are all young kids which is basically just a shit show right you've got uh you know kids running up and down the aisle you got goldfish flying everywhere you're trying to keep one kid in the seat the other one's screaming or crying and it's just mayhem (laughs) so that's what you have to look forward to uh if you get uh, at some point that's what you have to look forward to and if you have difficult kids on top of that well that's just what it is so for me the whole point here is that work-life balance is uh, you know work is a not a bad thing right now because you know family life although obviously i'm very happy to have the family that i have and i'm blessed and all that it's very challenging and nobody ever says that but the truth is it's the hardest damn thing that i've ever done building these businesses and houses and all that stuff that's easy in comparison to this so i'm not trying to scare you guys but i'm just trying to tell you that you know life is what you want it to be and so for me i built businesses right now where i have time for myself i have time for the family but i also commit a lot of time to my business because i enjoy it and to be honest with you it's easier <laughs> with kids sometimes uh, so i don't take you know i haven't really scaled down the amount that i work right now um, because it's just it's kind of a happy place for me now i also think on top of that it's important to have hobbies right hobbies are huge and for anybody that doesn't have hobbies, you know, you grow up sometimes, you lose your hobbies, you got to find them again, right? Whatever it is that you like to do when you're younger, start doing them again or pick up some hobbies that you can carry with you throughout life. You know, I like bowling. I like golf. I play basketball two to three times a week. They're all very important hobbies for me. So hobbies, right? You got to have hobbies. That's the point here. If you don't, Get back into whatever it is that you used to like to do. Pick up hobbies you can do for the rest of your life. Bowling, golf, uh, you know, those are things you can do. And uh, they're a lot of fun. I got a bowling league that I uh, roll in every uh, Wednesday night. I golf whenever I can. Less now because I got the kiddos. But, you know, those are things you can do with friends, with people. You can do them your whole life. I feel bad for people that don't have hobbies. I really do because, you know, traveling, people say, oh, I travel. That's my hobby. You got to get something more than that, right? Everybody likes to travel and go see stuff. It's a little easier when you don't have two little maniac children running around. But everybody likes to do that. You got to get hobbies, things that you can commit to, that you like getting better at. It fulfills you. It gives you things to do. Um, It's just, it's a good part to do. So anyway, back to my whole point here, work-life balance. Design the business that you want. And it's okay to pivot, right? If you start to build this massive high volume operation business and it's not what you want and you don't like the management and the overhead and the obligation, then scale it back. Do something else, pivot a little bit. Build the business that you want and then figure out which chapter of life you're in and how they all kind of match up. And uh, you know, everything is fluid, right? It always changes, nothing's static. And so if the business is what it is today, you can always change it next year. You can dial it back or you can beef it up or you can work more, you can work less. You just gotta figure out what makes you happy and what's the kind of business that you want to run. 
And if you do that, then you've got you've hit the lottery in my opinion because real estate's one of those businesses where you can do it forever. You never have to actually retire because personally I think once you retire you start dying. But you can dial back what you're doing, right? You can take on less projects, you can get projects in different ways. Uh, that's why real estate's such a beautiful business because it keeps you engaged and you can do it forever. You never have to retire. So anyway, that's my thoughts on this whole uh, work-life balance. Maybe it made some of you guys laugh, a couple stories about uh, how messy my personal life is sometimes. Maybe some of you guys can relate, right? And I've had some conversations off the record. I know some of you guys can relate with that. So maybe some more of you guys can now that I told the stories. But uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this week's episode. It's a busy week. It's all I got for you. I'll see you all again next week.